Okay, let's have a look and see. Um, just want to see if we're live. Um, okay. okay. Let's have a look and see. It looks like we're good. Just want to see if we're live. live. Let me see. We're live on Zoom or we're live somewhere else? We should also be live on YouTube. We're live on YouTube oh. as okay. well. Um, so let me just check. Um, Okay, so it's now eight o'clock as well. Okay, so we seem to be live streaming on YouTube. Um, let me okay, Shaman, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay. Um, you don't need to do anything until you're done. Let's see. Okay, good. We're about 120 people, and I think there's a bunch of people more on on uh, YouTube as well, and they'll just keep streaming in. Um, I think a chunk of the conference will as well. Um, I don't know if you've seen Shamit, but the strings this year is 2,100 people strong. <laughs> yeah, I saw it. It's huge. <laughs> it really is. Um, okay, so I just want to. Bring up slide. Okay, so we're good to go. I'm gonna share my screen now and I'll just make some preliminary comments and then um, we can take it from there. Sounds great. So welcome everybody to the public lecture um, of the Strings 2020 conference coming to you from a cold winter's night in Cape Town. Um, and right now it is midnight um, for people coming to us from the east and early in the morning for our speaker. 
Um, <clears throat> um, and I want to welcome you all uh, to the public event of this um, uh, 31st edition of the annual Strings Conference um, for the first time in Africa, <laughs> for the first time in the middle of a plague, and for the first time completely online. I'm, I'm really delighted that um, so many of you could make it tonight. Um, <clears throat> and before we get started with um, Professor Kartru's talk, I want to just go over some of our um, rules of engagement, just to make sure that we all have a good um, time listening to the lecture. Um, uh, you can ignore the first one, which is um, uh, to read our code of conduct. It's on our webpage for strings. Um, for the um, for people joining us from the conference itself, you've um, hopefully read it. Um, and uh, for those of you who are who are signed into Zoom, um, it would be really great if you've signed in with your real full name, so that when we take questions, we know who we're talking to, um, and we can engage fully. Um, to keep the flow of the talk, um, we're going to ask you to keep your questions to the end of the talk. Um, to ask a question, um, I'd like you to uh, raise, use the raise hand feature on Zoom. Um, <clears throat> you can also send a private message to the chair of the, of the session, who, uh, which is Jonathan Schock, um, and wait for him to call on you. Um, but we'd kind of prefer you use the raise hand feature. Um, because if the venue starts getting really full, it's kind of hard to discern um, uh, chats on the page. Um, we would like you to um, use the chat feature uh, and try and um, keep to um, asking physics related questions. Um, you can do that um, and just ask to anyone. Or if you want to send an organizational question, um, privately to an organizer or send um, uh, a question to the session chair um, to ask the speaker. Um, we'd really love to see you um, so that we can we can have an engagement um, and, and, and see who we're talking to. But we would like to ask you to just keep in mind um, uh, your background and your environment. Um, <clears throat> so just be mindful of your background. Um, and the other two announcements don't really apply to this talk. So I'm going to, I'm going to give it over to um, our moderator, session chair, um, Jonathan Schock from the University of Cape Town to introduce our speaker. Hey, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so welcome everybody, as Jeff said, to the, this part, the public talk of um, Strings 2020. Um, so I'm going to sort of talk a little bit as if uh, for, for the public, for people who, who might not have been here over the last few days. Um, so we're now on around three decades of um, these string theory conferences, which bring together uh, many hundreds of people generally working in the field um, and is sort of a celebration of the work and there's an opportunity for people to come together and discuss uh, what's been happening over the last year. Um, and of course, we're in a rather strange situation at the moment. Um, but in some senses, it has meant that uh, perhaps more than ever, we've been able to get more people um, interacting in, in novel ways, which has really been fantastic. So, so far, we've had three days of fascinating talks uh, from some of the leaders in the field discussing the, uh, the work over the last, uh, the last year. And lots and lots of discussion, um, both in the talks themselves and also on the various uh, sort of virtual channels that have been set up on Slack and on Zoom, um, which has been been really wonderful. So we have two more days left. Um, and given the circumstances, I think we've had so far a, a pretty amazing conference. Um, so in general, each year we have a, a, a public talk. Um, the String Conference has a public talk. Um, and it's generally not only somebody who uh, is a, a leader in the field, but somebody who's also a, a great communicator. Um, and this year, we're delighted to have um, Professor Shamit Kachru uh, take this spot. Uh, so Shamit is the chair of the Department of Physics at Stanford University in the US, um, where he works on a very wide range of areas in string theory and cosmology and condensed matter physics and beyond, and has, has made enormous contributions over the course of his career. Um, he was actually out in Cape Town, uh, I guess about four years ago now, um, and gave a public talk then, which was, which was superb. Um, and so we're, we're very happy to have him uh, 
come along this time. So um, having completed his undergraduate degree at uh, Harvard University, he went on to uh, do his PhD at Princeton um, under the supervision of Edward Witten. Um, before becoming a professor at Stanford, he had been positions in Rutgers um, and UC Berkeley and the Institute for Advanced Studies and UC Santa Barbara. Um, he's won many awards from the Simons Foundation Award to the Sloan Fellowship and more, and supervised many dozens of students, um, many of whom themselves have now gone on to, uh, to do great work and, and make breakthroughs in the field. Um, he, he also um, uh, has an interest in uh, sort of mathematical biology, which is a, a separate area, which I guess he's not going to talk about today. Um, but last time he was here in Cape Town, we had some, some good discussions about that. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy to, to have him here to talk today. Um, and today he's going to be talking about the hidden geometry uh, of space time. So thank you very much, Shamit. Uh, do you see my screen? Not at the moment. Uh, okay. Now? Yes, perfect. Yep. Okay. So I'm delighted to be here uh, at the first African Strings. It, it gives me special pleasure to be speaking at, at an event hosted uh, in South Africa, though unfortunately I'm giving my talk for my Stanford office. Uh, so I'll be talking about um, some of the features of, of string theory and in, in particular some of the interesting geometries that arise there. Um, if you can see my, my pointer, this is a, an image of, of one of the spaces, the hidden geometries that I'll be talking about. So modern physics, um, writ large has revealed to us a really bewildering array of different forces and particles. Uh, the most recently discovered is the, some of the so-called Higgs boson found at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. But there are also particles that transmit forces, the photon, which is related to electromagnetism, um, shown on this chart here, and various forces, uh, strong force and, and the weak nuclear forces uh, that were also discovered by physicists in the 20th century. And then there's an array of, of quarks that make up the proton and neutron and particles like the electron that occur in standard metals uh, in the real world. Now, as I said, most recently and excitingly in, in very complicated particle collisions shown here schematically with, you know, with color for the different lines of particles um, bending around in the collider, uh, the Higgs boson was discovered at CERN. In fact, there are two different kinds fundamentally of particles, so-called bosons and fermions that I'll talk about later. Um, and so the Higgs is the first of, of the matter particles that's a boson that we've discovered. Um, the photon and the other force carriers are also bosons. Now, in addition to this discovery at, at the Large Hadron Collider, shown here as a, as a little ring uh, in Geneva, this little ring is, is 27 kilometers in circumference. Um, there are plans in the works for an FCC, a future linear, a circular collider that will be 100 kilometers long um, with many times the energy of the LHC. And we're all wondering what we might discover there. Um, but happily for my talk, um, we don't have to wait the, the 30 or so years until that machine turns on. I'm instead going to be talking about the force that we first understood historically in some detail, um, in quantitative detail, namely gravity. And here's the apocryphal picture of, of Newton um, being bonked on the head by an apple. In fact, much of Newton's um, breakthrough work was done when he was in hiding in the countryside during a plague. So my hope is that one of uh, our young colleagues is doing uh, work of similar impact uh, even as we speak now. Now, Newton's understanding, uh, which was built on a mathematical breakthrough, his discovery of calculus, um, really brought the connection between uh, dynamics in the heavens, like the fact that uh, you, you know, the, the moon orbits the Earth and the nature of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Um, it, it related that to the way apples fall you know, very close to the Earth by a universal law, Newton's universal law of gravitation, that just said that the force between two objects, say um, the Earth of mass m1 and the sun of mass m2, goes like the product of the masses and falls inversely with the square of the distance between them. And we all learned this uh, in high school. But, you know, although Newton's, Newton's discovery was, was um, epical and, and is more or less correct for many things, it's not exact. As you refine understanding in science, things change. And the next big advance came with Einstein in the 20th century. Um, and Einstein's big advance um, was to realize that really at the heart of it, gravity, 
is not given by an instantaneous force law with inverse square dependence, depending on masses of, of particles, but instead it's a geometric theory. Um, it's a theory where the basic object is not an inverse square law, it's instead a theory of curved space-time geometry. So much as Newton used calculus, Einstein used the theory of curved geometry. And in Einstein's theory, what happens is when there's a mass of particle here, maybe the sun at the center, it tells space how to curve. It curves the, the space-time itself through its matter and energy. And then other particles like the earth moving in the gravitational field of the sun are really just secretly moving on the, the, the shortest path they can, the analog of a straight line in curved geometry um, in that curved space. So instead of instantaneous action at a distance, as in this Newtonian law, there's a theory of dynamical space-time geometry. As I said, Einstein's theory evolved in part using the language of Riemannian geometry, which is a theory of curved space. So just as Newton had his calculus, which was a breakthrough in mathematics that tied deeply to the structure of gravity, Einstein had his Riemannian geometry, another theory in mathematics that tied deeply to the next big advance in gravity. So my goal in this talk is to pick up this theme of the interrelationship between studies of fundamental facts about gravity uh, and geometry in, in pure mathematics, and to update you on some of the striking new directions the study of connections between physics and geometry has gone uh, in the past few decades. Now, in talking about this, I'll, I'll choose you know, one path through what's really a very large body of work. And I think the common theme here will be that the hero of our story uh, is not going to be a person uh, and that person's work. Instead, it's gonna be a theoretical framework called string theory, which um, we'll see examples of in this talk has sort of served as a magical generator of connections between physics and geometry. So I should start with a very brief introduction to string theory. Um, as the name would suggest, String theory is a theoretical structure that's built on um, the notion that at, at the most basic level, you know, these fundamental particles I started the talk with um, are secretly at very short distances uh, made of tiny loops of string. Now, here I've shown um, a tiny loop of string with oscillations on it, right? It's wiggling around. Those, those oscillations are excitations of the string. But in, in the, the string theories that we envision, those oscillations, in fact, are very energetic. They're much more massive than the, the particles that we've seen in colliders. And the basic elementary particles we see are different versions of the lightest string states, if you want the, the ground states or, or least energetic states of the string. Now, it's a fact about this theory, and this fact will be crucial for our foray into geometry, that it naturally lives in higher dimensions. We could engage in a debate about what the most natural dimension is in this theory, but I think all string theorists would agree that it's higher than, than, than three plus one, the three dimensions of space and one of time that we see. And one simple starting point lives in nine plus one dimensions. So nine dimensions of space and one of time. Now, very elementary attempts to make contact with the real world tell you that if there are extra dimensions of space, they better somehow be on different footing than the three large dimensions that we learn about, you know, as soon as we're born, um, we can go forward or left or right or up or down. Okay, and as a consequence, um, in a theory with extra dimensions, what one has to consider is compactifications of the theory, where all that compactification means is that if they're extra dimensions, they have to be curled up in a space that has finite extent, for example, a circle. And if then the circle is small enough, uh, physical observers won't notice it until they do experiments at high enough energies to resolve that tiny, tiny circle. Okay, now this notion of compactification wasn't new with string theory. In fact, Kaluza and Klein in the early 20th century had the following interesting thought. At that time, you see now we have this bewildering array of forces and particles I told you about. But at that time in 1920, the bewildering array was much simpler. The two forces were electromagnetism and gravity. And they noticed that in a certain sense, if space had one extra dimension, so we lived in a universe with four space and one time dimension, by that extra dimension were on a circle, so above each point that we see in space, there would be a tiny circle. Then a purely gravitational theory, a unified theory in five dimensions could naturally give rise to physics that looked in one, one dimension lower if you ignore the circle as if it had both the gravitational field and the photon, a, a particle that behaves much like the photon and electromagnetism. The details of their theory did not work, um, but the conceptual insight that gravity in higher dimensions can give rise to both gravity and other forces in lower dimensions has survived. Now, this higher dimensional string theory, um, in contrast with the theory studied by Kaluza and Klein, has also some other important physical properties. 
One is the theory automatically comes with a theory, sorry, with a, a structure called supersymmetry, at least in nine plus one dimensions. So I mentioned earlier in the talk that the elementary particles we know come in sort of two qualitative flavors. They're fermions, uh, like the electron. These are particles that obey the Pauli exclusion principle that you learn about in chemistry, right? So the reason that we can build up a periodic table uh, of atoms is that electrons have an aversion to being in exactly the same quantum state. No two electrons can be in exactly the same quantum state. And that's because they're what are called fermions. In technical parlance, their wave function is anti-symmetric when you exchange identical fermions. There's another kind of particles, bosons, which are reflected in our standard model of particle physics in terms of force carriers like the photon of electromagnetism or this Higgs boson that was recently discovered. And in supersymmetry, what happens is in fact, there's a pairing for every fermion, there's a boson with very similar properties, but just that differs by this statistical fact that it's a boson instead of a fermion. So there's sort of a mirror that reflects each fermion into a boson and vice versa. This symmetry is not a symmetry of our world. If it's, if it's an approximate symmetry of our world, it's been broken and we haven't seen it restored yet. But it's a useful theoretical tool and it's present in the nine plus one dimensional limits of these string theories. The second thing that comes naturally out of string theory automatically without being put in by hand is gravity. And in fact, at long wavelengths and low energies, it's gravity of exactly the sort that Einstein studied. So Einstein gravity, instead of being put in by hand when one studies um, quantum strings, emerges at long wavelengths um, as a prediction. So again, in string theory, like in Einstein's theory, Riemannian geometry, the geometry of curved spaces, plays a crucial role. In this theory, when there's matter, it tells the space to curve. And if matter is moving in curved space, the curvature tells the matter how to move. It should move on the straightest line that's possible in the curved space between the two points it's traversing. Now, the basic object of interest in general relativity, and hence to some extent also in string theory, is something called a metric on the space. Now, I don't want to get into complicated equations, but let me explain intuitively what a metric is. Um, in our space, which is approximately flat, we live in a Euclidean geometry approximately, you know that if you want to find the quickest way to go from one point to another, um, well, it would be to take a straight line between the two points. Now, on a curved space, that notion is more non-trivial. Like, suppose, for example, we consider the curved space on the surface of a rabbit, right? A rabbit is a nice smooth object, but it's curved. And if you asked, staying on the surface of the rabbit, what's the fastest way to get from this point on the head to this point on the back? Well, you'd have to compute exactly you know, how far you'd have to go traversing various features of the curved rabbit, the curved space. Okay? So the metric is the feature of a curved space that tells you how to compute those distances. It governs the geometry of the surface and tells you what the fastest paths are. Locally on, for instance, this rabbit, every neighborhood would look approximately flat and you could do a Euclidean calculation, just take little straight lines, but globally the rabbit is clearly curved and the metric captures that global structure. A notable feature of the equations that Einstein produced and one that's born out in our world where we see that Euclidean geometry works reasonably well um, is that its vacuum solutions are what's called Ricci flat. So this is a technical generalization of just plain old flat as in the Euclidean plane, which is flat. So an example of a space like that would be just, you know, the Euclidean plane in two dimensions is an example of a Ricci flat space. A slightly more non-trivial example would be to take a finite region on the plane, say a piece of paper, you identify the left and right sides of the paper, you could make this in your own home, and you identify the top and bottom parts, right? So you first fold over the paper left to right, then you fold it over top to bottom. When you fold it over left to right, you'll get a cylinder. And when you identify the top and bottom, you'll get um, what's called a torus, which is the surface of a donut. Now, because you made that by doing smooth operations to a flat piece of paper, that space is still flat. But now it's much more non-trivial than the plane. It has this the structure of the surface of a donut. So those are examples that you should keep in mind. Now, in general, and in string theory in particular, this is Physicists like to study simplified models of phenomena. We call these spherical cows. Okay, so in introductory mechanics classes, if you're studying mechanics, you might have a, you know, a homework problem that says, assume a spherical cow of uniform density. Here's the picture of the spherical cow, and then you compute something. Now, clearly these spherical cow approximations when generalized away from the context of cows aren't arbitrarily accurate. 
For instance, if you wanted to compute you know, how many cows you could pack into a corral, maybe a spherical approximation with the approximate size of a cow being reflected in the size of the sphere would be reasonably accurate. You know, it would be pretty close to how many cows you could fit in there. On the other hand, if you want to compute the, the properties of a cow under small perturbations uh, or understand the, you know, the history of evolution of, of the, the splotches and structure of ears and noses on the cow, well, the spherical approximation isn't very good for that. Okay. So we're going to be studying models that are analogous to the spherical cow in the context of string theory. They're not fancy enough to be like the real world. They don't incorporate all the phenomena that you need, um, but they're a good starting point. And for us, these models will involve Ritchie flat, which I described before, supersymmetry preserving extra dimensions. So we start in 10 dimensions, nine plus one, and we reduce in such a way that the internal dimensions like the circle of Kaluza and Klein are both Ritchie flat and preserve whatever symmetry was there in the 10 dimensional theory, whatever supersymmetry. Now, there's some technical words here, but I'm gonna tell you what that leads to in practice. Um, it's, it's hard to make examples of non-trivial Ritchie flat spaces that preserve supersymmetry, okay? Some examples would be, well, just exactly flat space like in this plane or, or, the, or the torus that I, that I drew before, but these are a little too trivial. And there were some powerful theorems in mathematics that gave us some handle on much less trivial examples. So there's some technical conditions. Um, there's something in mathematics called a Kähler manifold and there's a topological invariant called the Chern class. And Calabi conjectured in the 1950s that for each topological space, that, that you know, a Kähler manifold with vanishing first turn class, um, there would be a unique Ritchie flat Kähler metric. Uh, in other words, you would get a solution of Einstein's equations that had a generalization of this flatness of the plane and the torus. Don't worry about the technical words. You're not going to need to know them and you know what they mean. And, and Yao, another mathematician, proved that this fact is true. So Yao's proof was not constructive. What he showed is given some basic data about a type of space, there would be a Ritchie flat solution of string theory, a solution of Einstein's equations, but it was not constructive. And the result is that the spherical cow models that many string theorists have played with for many decades involve four dimensional Minkowski spacetime, that's flat, basically flat Euclidean spacetime, but consistent with special relativity. And then the internal geometry is taken up by one of these so-called Calabi Yao spaces named after the two mathematicians who conjectured and proved that they exist. Okay, so those are the spherical cow models that we have in mind. And the main purpose of, of explaining these technical conjectures was just to make it clear why they're called Calabi Yao. That's not a te technical term, it's just names of some people who said that there should be solutions of the Einstein equation that look like this. How are these spherical cows? Well, for one thing, they're supersymmetric. We don't observe supersymmetry in the world. For another, there's a Minkowski four space here. Um, by all evidence, the real world has uh, some kind of sign of a positive cosmological constant. It may well be de Sitter space. And while both of those features, absence of supersymmetry and, and likely existence of a de Sitter, you know, four dimensional space time are very interesting, um, talking about them today would go beyond my chart. So I'm gonna instead stick with these spherical cows and discuss geometry problems that we've encountered in studying these simple models of the hidden dimensions. And it will turn out even in this very simple context, the analog of the spherical cow, there will be all kinds of rich connections of string theory to various subjects in physics and mathematics, including a bunch of things that I will define as we go along, duality, gauge theory, Einstein's equations, algebraic geometry, and differential geometry. Okay, so I'm now gonna start explaining all these terms and the interrelationships that become clear um, as you understand string theory in these spherical cow toy models. The first notion that I need to explain is that of duality. We're gonna explore some simple dualities in string theory. So to start with, I should tell you what is a duality. And there's nothing very complicated about the notion. So I've tried to illustrate it here um, with this picture. Uh, for those of you who know some history of philosophy, this picture is, is stolen from Wittgenstein, a philosopher in the early 20th century. Um, but the basic point of this picture is the following. It's that duality is what happens when there are two equally valid ways of viewing the same system. Neither view is correct or incorrect. Each view gives you partial information about the system. So in this picture, for instance, if you rotated it to the left by 90 degrees, then just staring at it with the normal orientation, you'd guess it's a rabbit, probably, a rabbit facing to the left. Whereas in the way it's drawn, if you look you know, along the horizontal axis like this, it's kind of like a duck, right? This is the duck's beak. 
whereas when rotated, these are the rabbit ears, and this is the duck's wings, whereas when rotated, these are the rabbit's feet. Neither description of the picture is right or wrong. It can look like a duck or a rabbit, and each description makes different features of the single true picture manifest. So duality is what happens not just in this rabbit duck picture, but in physics or mathematics, when there are two equally valid ways of viewing the same system. And the value of it is that things that are manifest in one picture may be very non-trivial in the other. So it's a way to learn things um, by, by finding dual descriptions that may make features that were previously mysterious manifest. In string theory, the way duality most often arises is because the strings of string theory see geometry, they probe geometry in a different way than point particles do because they're extended objects. They wiggle around with finite extent. And so the way they see the geometry can be somewhat fuzzier than you'd see it with a point particle. So let's start by considering the simplest possible example of a string compactification, um, that on a circle, right? The circle is just the line with, with some points identified. And so um, it should be the most you know, trivial place to start. And beyond the kinds of oscillations that were present in the first picture I showed you of a closed loop of string, um, when on a circle, a string has two other means of being excited, of having some energy. Um, one way it could have some kind of energy. Um, there's a circle here, you know, and then there's some other space-time dimensions that are still non-compact like this plane. Well, it could wrap the circle. So if you're having trouble imagining what it means for a string to wrap a circle, you've all played with rubber bands. You can take your finger or a door handle and wrap the rubber band on the door handle. And you know you could wrap it around there once, or you could wrap it around there twice, or you could wrap it around there three times. It gets tighter and tighter. There's more and more energy stored in the rubber band as you tighten it. So that's one way that you can excite the string. It can have some winding. Another way that you could excite the string is it could simply be moving around the circle. If you take a particle in space time and throw it, right, like a baseball, it has some energy in the momentum that you impart to it when you throw it. So a string moving around this circle would have some energy just from the fact that it has a velocity. It's moving around the circle. So we call those, those forms of um, excited string momentum and winding modes with the obvious names. It's an old fact from quantum mechanics that I'm just gonna have to state to you that, okay, in quantum mechanics, you know, particle positions and momenta are replaced by wave functions that give you probabilities that a particle has a certain position or momentum. And single valuedness of the wave function, the fact that the wave function should be well-defined and give a well-defined probability everywhere around this circle of space requires in quantum mechanics that momentum on that circle has to be quantized in units of the inverse radius of the space. So if the radius of the circle is r, there could be momentum one over r or two over r or three over r around that circle, but not momentum pi over r. On the other hand, you know, you could also consider these, these states of the string that wind the circle here. And well, there, kind of clearly, if you wind something around a circle of radius r and the thing that you're winding has tension, the energy will scale with the number of times it winds, right? It's going to be the tension times the radius of what it's winding. So if it winds once, the energy will be proportional to r. I'm leaving out proportionality constants that are made up by the string tension itself, which has dimensions. If it winds twice, it'll have energy 2r. Once three times, it'll have energy three R and so forth. So the spectrum of the string theory will contain states with energies that are governed by these momenta and by these windings. That would be the set of particles that an observer who lives in the lower dimensional space and doesn't know about the circle, she would just see all these possible excited states produced in colliders and conclude that there's a tower of particles with energies like this and like this. Well, if you stare at those formula for a second, you realize that the set of energy levels there exhib exhibits an exchange symmetry. That the winding modes on a circle of radius r have the same set of energies as the momenta on a circle of radius one over r. Now, radius has dimensions of length. So what I mean by one over r is you make up the dimensional units with units of the tension or basic size of the string which in, in you know, the models that people talk about is thought to be very close to the Planck distance of 10 to the minus 30 centimeters or so. Okay. But the spectrum of string theory on a circle of size r is the same as that on a circle of size one over r. And so we conclude that while for a particle, a big circle and a small circle are very different, we can all you know, perceive very, very clearly the difference between a big you know, a hula hoop and, and a rubber band, string theory on a circle of radius r 
is the same as string theory on a circle radius one over r with the one appropriately interpreted. Now, you might have thought that this kind of bizarre fuzziness, which relied on this equivalence between momenta and windings and simple multiples of r in the energies, um, would only happen for very simple spaces like the circle. And one of the messages of this talk is to say that's not so, but the way that the bizarre fuzziness manifests gets more and more interesting and mathematically richer as you go beyond simple spaces like the circle. So to discuss this, I'm gonna consider strings on what, you know, one of these Calabi Yau spaces. Those are just names of mathematicians. These spaces prove to exist by Calabi and Yau. And I'm gonna do this by considering one such topology. So I used the word topology before. Let me, let me describe in a little more detail what I mean by a topology. Let's do this with the case of a donut, right? So here's a nice donut. It looks pretty delicious, except it's blue. But we could smoothly deform it without tearing or ripping, right? So here we've deformed it a little. We're making a bump. Then we're enlarging the bump and making an indentation in the bump. Then we're making the, the bump even bigger and making the rest of the donut, the handle, smaller. And eventually, we end up with a coffee cup. We can do this smoothly starting from this donut without ever ripping or tearing anything. What that means, this mathematics of equivalent objects that can be deformed into one another without ripping or tearing, um, that notion of, of smooth deformability characterizes a fixed topology. And what we say is a coffee cup and, and this donut um, have the same topology. So topology is the study of objects that differ by these smooth deformations. Whereas geometry, of course, the geometry of this, of this cup is very different from the geometry of the donut. Distances between points certainly changed when we did this deformation. Now what Yao's theorem says, this is the theorem proved by the mathematician Yao, is that given some topology that admits, you know, like a torus here, that admits um, one Ricci flat metric, there are in fact many different metrics on that same topology that solve the Einstein equations. It doesn't just give you one solution, it gives you a family. And in fact, that family is naturally divided into sort of two spaces of possibilities. One is you could take this don donut now drawn in Mathematica, it, really it's the surface of the donut, the two torus, and you could sort of squish handles or, or change the basic shape of it. You're not rescaling it, but you're changing the size of some handle of, of, of this donut, right? So you can vary the shape and technically people call that the complex structure. There's a, there is a more formal definition. But another thing you could do is you could take this, this hollow donut and you could just enlarge it make a bigger donut. That's just varying the size. And again, that has a technical generalization called Kähler structure. You could change the size, keeping the, the shape like this fixed, okay? And so by varying either the shape or the size, you get not just one solution of Einstein's equations from one of these spaces that were found by Calabi and Yao. You get a whole family, okay? So what physicists talk about um, in, in, the, in the connection with this kind of mathematics is two different spaces of possibilities. These are spaces of solutions to the Einstein equations, a moduli space of complex structures and a moduli space of Kähler structures on a calabi -Yau. All that means is for each choice of this shape and for each choice of this size, you get a solution of the Einstein equations. And that moduli space is parameterizing the different solutions of the Einstein equations. Solution one, solution two, solution three. So these are just the parameter spaces of possible shapes and sizes of the space you're, you're, you're finding Einstein metrics on. So here's some pictures stylized. There's some complex structure moduli space. Each point here corresponds to a Ricci flat Kähler metric. And there's also the space of possible sizes. And so you put, pick a point here, pick a point here, and you get a solution of the theory. Now, those parameters are parameters in math. They're parameterizing solutions of the Einstein equations. But they also have to show up in the four dimensional physics you'd get by considering the nine plus one dimensional string theory reduced to three plus one dimensions on one of these spaces. And the way they would show up is as expectation values of scalar fields. So what does that mean? Um, a scalar is just a quantity that assigns a number uh, to a situation. Like in a room, there's a temperature at every point in, this, in the room, right? And so you could assign a function t of x to points x in the room. Temperature is a scalar. It just gives you a number associated with every point of space. Similarly, here, when you have a solution of the Einstein equations, like this torus, sitting above every point in space, there's a scalar which tells you what is the size of that solution. And if it's constant, there's just one sort of fixed size torus over every point in, in our space, in, in the three plus one dimensional space time. That's, that's one of the values of one of these scalar fields. So these scalar fields 
show up one-to-one -one in correspondence with the possible ways of changing the shape of the internal dimensions and the possible ways of changing the size. In the example of Kaluza and Klein with a circle uh, you know, hidden above each point of our space, there would be one of these scalars just telling you the radius of the circle. Okay. And another famous example of such a scalar is of course the Higgs, the Higgs field that was discovered at the LHC. So if you follow science at a popular level, you know, in the New York Times, after the Higgs discovery was announced, you would see pictures like this, where the Higgs field, the scalar, has rolled to assume a particular value in our universe. That particular value characterizes the masses of the elementary particles we see, or at least it's one contribution to them for strongly interacting particles. It's actually not the dominant contribution. Now, these fields appear in the four-dimensional physics in interesting ways. Okay, for instance, um, they control the values of the strengths of low energy interactions, which I'm going to talk much more about in a second. Okay, so for instance, in electromagnetism, there's a fine structure constant alpha that governs how electrons and photons couple to each other or how two electrons interact uh, in a chemical element. But that strength of interaction, you know, there's a dimensionalist thing there that's controlling the strength uh, with which electrons repel each other in electromagnetism. That's called the fine structure constant. In these theories that have scalar moduli, phi, that fine structure constant could be a function of phi. As you change the value of the radius of the extra dimensions, for instance, um, the strength of the low ener energy interactions could change. Now, where are we? We have these spaces that we're told to, you know, that we were told exist by, by Claudia and Yao. And when we put string theory on them, we get spaces of solutions of the Einstein equations. And they have physical consequences. They, for instance, govern the strengths of interactions in the low, low energy world that we see resulting from this toy model of string theory. But there's an important detail. There are actually different versions of 10-dimensional string theory. They were very creatively named 2A string theory and 2B string theory um, by people who realized that at low energies, they become what had been creatively named 2A supergravity and 2B supergravity. These are generalizations of Einstein's theory with supersymmetry. Now, I said in string theory, the low energy interactions analogs of the fine structure constant that governs you know, electron electron scattering in QED are governed by scalar fields. But it turns out which scalar fields matter differs in the two theories. In the 2A string theory, the coupling constants are controlled by what I called size moduli or Kähler moduli. While in the 2B theory, the coupling constants are controlled by shape moduli or what I call complex structure moduli more technically. Also, the, the classical or quantum nature of these couplings differs too. In the 2A string theory, quantum corrections exist to the basic structure of, of the geometry of, of, of this space, uh, for instance, to the coupling constants. Whereas in 2B string theory, the classical results are exact. There are non-renormalization theorems that say if you compute something classically, you can get the exact answer. Now, this is interesting precisely if we find a way to use, for instance, 2A string theory um, and 2B string theory in concert so that questions which are hard in one become easy in the other. The quantum corrections when they exist are horrendous to calculate. So in the 2A picture where quantum corrections exist and couplings are controlled by size moduli, the corrections actually in practice couldn't be calculated for, for many decades, they can now. Um, they correspond geometrically um, to a certain elegant quantity. They correspond to counts of spheres of minimal area uh, embedded in the calabi yau manifold that the 2A string theory is compactified on. So if you wanted to compute these quantum corrections, if you wanted to compute these quantum corrections, you would have to count spheres of minimal area embedded in the calabi yau manifold. In one simple calabi yau manifold, okay, the, such spheres were counted in the following way. They're labeled by an integer degree. This integer degree roughly controls the area of the sphere. So if there's this, you know, this, this, uh, this schematic depiction of a sphere, there could be something with this area or something with twice that area or three times that area. It turns out that they're quantized in a nice way. And that, that area is controlled by a quantity mathematicians called the degree. So it could be one or two or three. And in one simple example of such a space, mathematicians had worked for years and had almost made it to degree three. So at degree one, they found this number of curves. At degree two, this number of curves. 
this is a classical problem in algebraic geometry that goes back to the really the 19th century. Now, there's this great quote from Leibniz, who is Newton's competitor, uh, the universe that God chose to exist is the best of all possible worlds. So at least in this particular case of string theory, things work out that way. You see, in the 2A string theory on this Calabi-L, you'd have had to take these degree one and two results of mathematicians and then compute laboriously three, four, five, and six, and seven, and so on to get the quantum corrections you need to understand physics. But in string theory, it turns out that there's a different dual 2B version of the same physics. So there's one Claudia manifold X, say this guy on which you have to compute these numbers of curves and you've worked for a long time and gotten two numbers. But there's another Claudia manifold Y <clears throat> that um, for instance, Green and Plesser told us how to find years ago. And by compactifying instead the 2B string theory on Y instead of 2A on X, we end up with the same physics. But now all the quantities we're interested in are governed by classical results. We don't have to compute any of these difficult quantum corrections. And so it turned out that there's a duality generalizing the R to one over R duality of string theory on a circle that says that the physics of string theory on two manifolds with drastically different topologies can be identical. The coupling constants that are controlled by quantum corrections on X can be discovered by doing classical computations on a mirror manifold Y, a distinct manifold compactified, um, you know, used for compactification in a distinct string theory where all calculations are classical. So this was turned into a beautiful and precise work of mathematics by Philip Candel, Zinnia del Asa, Paul Green and Linda Parks. And in their paper, they produced the two numbers mathematicians knew and a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. And in fact, they could produce an infinite list of these numbers which get larger and larger. This results in striking and by now verified mathematical prediction of string theory um, for these numbers of minimal spheres embedded in calabi manifolds. Now, it's very famous that, you know, early in the history of QED, um, people got great confidence in the theory by computing corrections and learning that to many decimal places they could match experiment. It is a sad but true fact that right now string theory does not make quantitative predictions for particle experiment or for gravitational experiment that differ from those of the standard model or general relativity. But it does make predictions for mathematics. And by going to higher and higher degrees K, one gets predictions of arbitrarily many decimal places that have been verified by mathematicians and that come from this incredibly profound and mysterious source. Okay, so this subject of what's called mirror symmetry, that there exist pairs of topologically distinct manifolds used in different string theories to get the same physics remains very active and fruitful, though I'm not gonna to continue to talk about it. Um, in fact, there's a, a major collaboration of mathematicians run by the Simons Foundation that's now you know, trying to prove fundamental theorems, establishing the existence of mirror symmetry and exploring its applications in mathematics. Okay, I have about 20 minutes left. And I'm now gonna to turn to a naively distinct subject. So if you're lost, that's okay. We're gonna start again and we're gonna start with something different but I promise it'll connect back up. So we're all forced in high school to learn Coulomb's law, right? That says that if you have an electric charge Q1 here and an electric charge Q2 here, there's a force between them. It looks very Newtonian. It's Q1 times Q2 divided by R squared. And there's a, a constant there, which I call the fine structure constant, basically controlling the strength of that inverse square. Now, what we don't learn in high school is that the coupling constant that appears in that law isn't actually constant, okay? In quantum mechanics, anyone who's sort of read the most basic facts about um, you know, the vacuum in, in quantum theory knows that electron-positron pairs can virtually appear in the vacuum. And those virtual pairs of particles that appear in quantum fluctuations can act to screen the Coulomb force. So when you have particles that are very close together, um, you know, there's a certain amount of space for these pairs to appear. And as the particles get further and further apart, there's more. When a virtual pair appears, the positron will be attracted to a negative charge, the electron to a positive charge, and it will screen the electromagnetic force. The result is if you actually do experiments trying to measure the strength of electromagnetism defined suitably, you'll find that as you move in distance R, the effective coupling constant you get, you measure gets smaller and smaller. 
Okay, so in QED at low energies, we're taught that the fine structure constant is approximately one over 137. <clears throat> but in fact, if you, if you go to higher and higher energies, you get electrons and, and, and electrons or electrons and positrons closer and closer together and measure the effect of electromagnetic interaction between them, you'll find that there's less screening and the strength of, of, of the force increases. Just down the road from where I'm giving this talk at SLAC, experiments done in the 1990s, which were used to discover the, the force carriers of the weak electromagnetic force, measured alpha to be one over 128 at the energy corresponding to production of, of one of those force carrying bosons, the Z boson. Now that's great, it just makes our life easier as we go to longer and longer distances and humans are pretty big on the scale of particles. So we're, you know, we're usually interested in things at very long distances. Um, the interactions get weaker and weaker and it's very easy to understand very weak interactions. You just do perturbations in the strength of the interaction. Unfortunately, nature also contains strong interactions like in the nuclear force. Okay, so here we see nucleons pictured. Um, there's an atomic picture with some electrons going around a nucleus. Obviously the size of the nucleus is exaggerated by many, many orders of magnitude. And there's some protons and some neutrons and they're bound together by pion exchange into a nucleus. Now the powerful accelerators built over past decades acted as microscopes to let us see further into this, right? So there's the electron and the nucleons, but we could, we could whack into these and, and see what's inside. And it turns out the proton and neutron themselves, if you look with a powerful enough microscope, are made of smaller constituents, uh, these quarks. And I showed you a picture of the six quark families that we know, or the six quarks, that, that there are only a few families, um, on the first slide. Now, the strong force, unlike the weak force, gets stronger as you go to long distances, and unlike the electromagnetic force, right? So here we have this picture where in electromagnetism, because of screening, the appearance of electrons and positrons that screen um, through their virtual nature, the electromagnetic force, the effect of electromagnetic coupling gets weaker with distance. In the strong force, it's the opposite. What actually happens is that there's anti-screening. As you move to higher and higher energies, the force gets weaker, but that means as you move to longer and longer distances, which is lower energies, the force gets stronger. So here are experiments that were shown as a function of energy and at long distance or low energy, you see that the strength of the interaction is going up and up. Okay, and that results in quark confinement. Although we see nucleons, we never see individual quarks. The quarks are confined uh, in triplets inside the proton and neutron. Okay, in fact, um, I stated this blithely as a fact, it's very hard to prove this fact. Gauge theories, or sorry, theories of interacting particles like this, like the theory of the strong force, where there's anti-screening instead of screening, where forces get stronger at large distance, are very hard to solve. We can make models that we can solve, um, but proving rigorously that quarks are confined is in fact um, depicted here by this bag of dollars, a clay problem worth a million dollars if you can prove it. Now, both electromagnetism and the strong interaction are, are described by types of theories known as gauge theories. So when I use the term gauge theory, I just mean a theory of, of matter particles interacting by exchange of forces that are quantum mechanical. And, and, and a general term for such theories are gauge theories. So electromagnetism is, a, is an example. QCD, the theory of strong interactions is an example. But the examples like QCD, like the strong force, where the interaction strength grows strong at long distance are too hard for us to solve. Now, a theme in my talk has been spherical cows. I like spherical cows a lot. We're too stupid to solve most physics problems, but we can often understand qualitatively the behavior of these spherical cow problems. And by adding supersymmetry, we can imagine spherical cow examples of such gauge theories. So instead of studying QCD or electromagnetism, we could study supersymmetric cousins. These would be spherical cows of the real world in much the same way that Calabi-Yau compactification might be a spherical cow version of a string theory that could potentially describe the real world. So can we solve such spherical cows? So what do I, first of all, what do I mean by solve them? For instance, in Riemannian geometry, I might say I've understood a geometry if I know the metric. What do I mean in a theory like QED or QCD? Well, in the supersymmetric models that we can talk about these spherical cows, there are again spaces of vacua, just like the compactifications of Calabi and Yao that had spaces of possible shapes and sizes. Supersymmetric gauge theories have moduli spaces of vacua. 
there are parameters. And as you change the parameters, you get a one parameter or multi-parameter family of different theories with adiabatically connected properties. The simplest examples have a one complex dimensional moduli space. Um, so, it, you know, it looks locally like the plane. And at generic points there, you get theories that you can sort of understand. They're QED-like, but there are special points where you can't understand them, where it's strongly coupled. What I will mean by solving a theory, you know, what I would mean in nature is I've solved the theory if having told you what the theory is, I can then give you a list of the precise masses and charges of the stable particles at all points on the space of, of vacuum states. Because in nature, what we'd like is a priori, someone tells us a theory at the fundamental level, and we then tell them, oh, if that's the theory, we're gonna see these chemical elements and those protons and this kind of you know, quark. Um, well, that would mean that we've understood really in a fundamental way what the theory is. So I'll say I've solved the theory if I can give you the precise masses and charges of all stable particles at all points on the space of possible theories, this moduli space. Supersymmetry gives us a tool to do this. So let me describe what I mean. In QED, the theory of you know, electromagnetism, you can imagine two kinds of charges. There are particles like electrons with electric charge. And there are other particles that you could imagine that we've never seen them that we would call monopoles, particles with magnetic charge. So you know, a magnetic monopole would be like an isolated North Pole from which magnetic field lines emanate just like an electron is an isolated electric charge from which field lines emanate. But in nature, we tend to see these things with both North and South poles. So we've never seen a monopole. But nevertheless, you can imagine in QED-like theories, theories with a single photon, both particles with electric charge and particles with magnetic charge. And in fact, you could imagine more complicated particles that carry both with some multiples. It could carry three units of electric charge and seven units of magnetic charge. So if we call the complex parameter in the simplest examples that I talked about that specifies our theory, call that A. What supersymmetry buys us is that in the supersymmetric theories that we can study, the simplest examples, there is a special function f of A, which controls all the particle masses, the coupling constant, and also even the geometry on this space of vacuum states, which is itself a Riemannian manifold. In particular, given this function f, what we know is that if there's a particle of charge Ne electric charge and charge Nm magnetic charge, so these are basically, you should think of them as integers, sometimes they're half integers. So if there's a particle with these charges, its mass is bounded below by the absolute value of a formula determined by the function f. And because of that, when it saturates this bound, when it reaches equality, such a particle can be exactly stable because there's no lighter particle to which it can decay consistent with energy conservation. So finding particles that saturate this kind of bound in a supersymmetric theory, finding all the such particles, gives you a way to argue that you found the precise masses and charges of particles at all points on the space of vacuum states. If you're strong enough to both compute F and compute the numbers of particles at each point saturating this bound for all values of the integers N, E, and N, M. Okay, right, so this is what I just said. To solve the theory, we need to determine F. And we need to determine this function number that depends on any e, NM and the point in moduli space. So here I phrased some challenging problems. It's hard to emphasize how much work these problems have inspired over the past 20 some years. Um, I could have rephrased them as purely mathematical ge you know, geometry questions, but they've been much explored in the physics literature. And there's a main challenge in sort of doing this kind of thing. There are many, but I have to oversimplify. I have about uh, 10 minutes left. So this kind of function f, when we take one of the theories we're interested in, say an analog, the simplest analog of QCD with supersymmetry, well, it starts life with a classical value. That's like the classical value of the, of the coupling between, say, the, the quarks in that theory. And then it starts getting quantum corrections. And some of the quantum corrections, we learned to compute at the feet of people like Feynman, who told us we can draw Feynman diagrams. And if they're simple enough, like these one loop diagrams, because there's that loop there, you know, even I can compute them. But it turns out that in these theories, beyond the loop calculations that you'd have to do, there's also something called instantons. These are, if you want, a physics analog of counting those non-trivial um, spheres embedded in Calabi-Yau. There's some kind of 
effect that goes beyond perturbative Feynman diagrams. Um, they're, they're field configurations of the gluon field of the strongly interacting theory of the force carrying particle. They're non-trivial field configurations. And there are configurations like that with one, two, three or more instanton number. You know, So they're labeled by an integer, sort of the number of instantons if you want. But determining their contributions, which is a counting problem of sorts again, is very difficult. Okay, so here the counting problem is to count instantons in a theory of strongly interacting gauge particles. Like these are, these are analogs of the photon, but with strong interactions. So this was actually done first, now a little over 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, in seminal work of Cyborg and Witten in quantum field theory. And one of the, the first pieces of, of work that I had fun with was finding that string theory also gives a striking way of solving such theories. Okay, what Cyborg and Witten did was amazing. They used very indirect logic on qualitative behaviors of this function f, together with basic knowledge of this function number to exactly determine both. They, they made an inspired guess and then proved that the guess is correct. But what we found is that, well, after their work, string theory also gives you a way of solving such theories and it doesn't require you to do anything clever at all. So it turns out we've been talking about string theory compactifications on Calabi M manifolds. And in geometry, one is usually happiest to study smooth spaces, smooth manifolds, the flat plane or the surface of a donut. But you can also ask what happens as you, as you take one of these smooth spaces here, I've shown a, you know, a nice smooth um, cylindrical looking space and I've collapsed the center. So it becomes conical, right? There's a, there's a singularity right there. It turns out that string compactifications on these singular types of spaces at the singularity manifestly give rise to supersymmetric strongly interacting gauge theories. And in fact, the classification of these singularities, the different ways that you can make a singularity, line up very nicely with precisely the data you need to specify you know, the, the data that goes into one of these simple supersymmetric field theories, which is a, a sort of choice of what the kinds of gluons or photons is. The string model that makes the interpretation in terms of gauge theory to singularity obvious is a 2A model. And in this 2A model, the instantons that we wish to compute to solve the quantum field theory, the gauge theory, are identified with minimal area spheres in the Calabi L space. And then using section three of my talk on mirror symmetry, we can dualize and find a purely classical picture. And, and we were able to do this with Klemmer, Jemeyer, and Vasa many years ago. So here, what string theory does is take a problem that can be solved by, by real insight and turn it into a problem that the theory has solved for you if you're just smart enough to ask the question. So it really requires much less insight, but it requires asking of string theory <clears throat> that it tell you the answer to the right question. So now I'm gonna try and combine the threads that I've, I've tried to weave in the first parts of my talk <clears throat> and talk more about the geometry of these hidden dimensions. And this part of the talk should be relatively short. So once again, we're gonna start again. This will be the hardest part of the talk, um, but if you bear with me for five minutes, I promise I'll get to a punchline that you can definitely understand. So, so far we've discussed two kinds of geometric problems and their applications to physics. Um, there's a famous quote by Wigner, um, which discusses the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and physics, that it's a miracle that there was calculus to allow Newton to understand gravity. And then there was differential geometry to allow Einstein to understand gravity and linear algebra to allow us to understand quantum mechanics, group theory to allow us to understand symmetries. Well, what string theory has started to show us um, in hints is that there's also an unreasonable effectiveness of physics and mathematics. Um, and I'm gonna try and give another example of that. Okay, but the two examples I've discussed so far are enumerative geometry and the physics of calabi yau compactification. We're just following your nose and studying generalizations of duality leads you to these striking infinite sets of mathematical predictions. And then in, in physics, just in, in understanding how to solve theories like QCD, but simpler spherical cow versions with supersymmetry, you get instanton counting problems and string theory again lets you solve those using geometry. A central role in, in all my discussion, and again, I could have gone in many different directions in such a talk, but there's limited time, was played by these calabi yau spaces. Now, the simplest calabi yau space is, is in some sense the two-dimensional torus, the surface of a donut, but that's too simple. And if you ask where is the, the next essentially more complicated space, 
but still somewhat of a spherical cow. Maybe easy enough that it's just barely beyond our understanding. There is a candidate for that. It's something called a K3 surface. K3 because three mathematicians with the last name K played uh, famous roles in its understanding and elucidation, uh, Kadira, Kummer, and Kaler. This is a unique non-trivial Calabi-Yau space in two complex dimensions. So it could be used to compactify a 10-dimensional world to six dimensions, or in concert with a torus to get a three plus one dimensional space time. Now, throughout the talk, I've discussed many things about these. I've discussed counting minimal spheres and making them singular and solving gauge theories. But I have not discussed the most basic piece of data that goes into specifying such a space in general relativity, namely its Ricci flat metric. This was guaranteed for us to exist um, by Calabi's conjecture and Yao's proof, um, but it would be nice to actually just write it down. So that's a problem in differential geometry. And an insight that came out of work of Tripathi and Zimmet, shown here, is that for K3, we can combine the two stories I've told you to obtain rather explicit analytical expressions for this metric, which solves Einstein's equations, and so solves the problem in differential geometry. But to explain that, um, I again need to tell you more about string theory that carries beyond this context. So the basic observation is rather simple. String theory is a theory of strings, right? There's a, a closed loop of string, which is the sort of fundamental string. But you know, there's two different kinds of strings you could consider in life. You could consider closed loops of strings like rubber bands, but you've also all seen jump ropes. You could consider open strings with ends. So it turns out in, in, in these physical string theories, the same is true. You can consider open strings with ends and the places where strings end are themselves interesting objects in the theory. They're solitonic objects, objects rather like monopoles in QED. Um, so it turns out that there's such an object for each integer P less than 10, the DP brain, and what are they? Well, a D zero brain, so when P is zero, that's just a zero dimensional object, a point that lives for all time and on which strings can end. A D one brain is a one dimensional object, a string that lives for all time and on which strings can end. A D two brain would then be like a sheet of paper, a plane that again extends through time. So it has two plus one dimensions and strings can end there. Okay, so string theory is a highly constrained structure. You can't just add to it willy nilly but within its list of ingredients, it was discovered in really beautiful work um, made most crystalline by Polchinski that it includes D brains. These, these solitons, these objects that occur with different dimensions on which strings can end. At low energies, you see given a D brain here, I've drawn some D2 brains, right? They're like planes and there are strings that can sort of end on them here. I've drawn the open strings that, that begin and end on the D brain. You can ask, what is the theory of stuff that lives on the D brain? And it turns out, well, that theory of stuff is given by understanding the low energy modes of the strings that end on the brain, just like the particles in string compactification are the low energy modes, the low energy states of a string uh, in the higher dimensional theory. Now, what that means is that low enough energies living on these D brains, say on a D2 or D3 brain, would just be an ordinary theory of matter particles interacting by forces, an ordinary gauge theory of the sort we discussed when I described QED and QCD, the theories of electromagnetism and the strong interactions. Now, there's a particularly useful packaging of the data of a K3 surface in some limit as the geometry that arises from a collection of a suitable set of these brains. You this will be the hardest that. technical part of the talk. Yeah. Five minutes. Um, okay. So you view the K3 surface as a collection of two tori, or these donuts that I've talked about extensively, that are varying in shape over a two dimensional sphere. So a torus is two dimensional, a two dimensional sphere is two dimensional. So the whole collection would be a four dimensional object. And as I said, a K3 surface is four dimensional. So that makes sense. But the variation is highly constrained because the K3 is Calabi Yau. And in particular, at special points as the, this, this donut is varying over the sphere, you know, and together sweeping out this K3 surface, it will degenerate. It will have one of these degenerations of the complex structure where you squish a cycle. You change the shape so something shrinks down to zero size. A little loop here shrinks down to zero size. So a solution of string theory that is closely related to string theory on K3 can be obtained by compactifying string theory on the two sphere. And and keeping track of this torus such that everywhere where the torus degenerates with one of these pinch cycles, 
you stick in one of these D brains, except instead of a zero brain, one brain or two brain, you stick in a D seven brain so that together with the two sphere, it fills the full 10 dimensions of space time. So this is already a mouthful. We take a K3 surface, we view it as a family of elliptic curves or tori varying over a sphere. Then we replace it with auxiliary data, which is just string theory on the sphere with some brains, some seven brains. But my claim is if you know enough about that set of brains, you can reconstruct the full geometry of K3. And now what we're gonna do to package that information is consider the quantum field theory on another brain that probes this K3 surface, a D3 brain on which lives a three plus one dimensional quantum field theory, a supersymmetric theory of exactly the sort I discussed in section four. So there's this D3 brain, it's moving around on the K3 surface, it's moving around actually on this P1, it doesn't see the tori, but it sees the seven brains you've inserted. It has a moduli space of vacua given by roughly this sphere because you can move it to different points, much like the gauge theories we consider in section four. And it has some exactly stable charged states, which I've called BPS states here. That's just a, initials of people that arise from strings that stretch from the D3 brains like these to this would be a seven brain at one of the singular elliptic fibers. So shown here is what I have in mind. We should imagine the square is a version of the sphere where you sort of glue things together. Uh, and um, it's really a Z2 cover of that. And then these lines are showing sort of strings stretching between our D3 brain and various of the singular fibers or seven brains. Okay. So to solve this D3 brain probe theory, we need the data I talked about in section four, a holomorphic function or a function F of A, where A is the coordinate on this sphere and a BPS state count for each point in the A plane. What are all of the states you can get this way that are stable? All the electric and magnetic charges. Okay, this is exactly the data that we packaged in section four. And in fact, if we can determine this data, we can do more than just solve this D3 theory. Because this data determined the metric on the space of, you know, the space of theories, the moduli space of the theory, Finding F will lead to the metric on the moduli space of the D3 theory. Turns out that finding F together with this number of BPS states, the data we wanted in section four, is enough to tell us everything about this family of varying tori and give us a metric on the K3 surface. Okay, so F plus number leads to a metric on K3. This is a very complicated problem, but the ideas of section three of the talk rescue us. It turns out that there's a dual problem a mirror problem in some technical sense that allows us to determine these numbers to read off these BPS degeneracies, analogous to counting curves in section three, counting the holomorphic curves, and then write the metric in this format. Now doing this in detail would take me far beyond the confines of a popular lecture and I'm out of time. So here's what I actually hope I conveyed. Parts of the talk I hope were, were definitely understandable, parts may not have been, but what I wanted to get across is the spirit of a subject that there different areas of physics and mathematics, algebraic geometry, um, counting cycles and sort of algebraic varieties, for instance, enumerative geometry, differential geometry, writing down metrics on interesting spaces. Uh, you know, the simplest examples are the plane and sphere and torus, but here we were interested in Calabi L spaces and strongly interacting quantum field theory, understanding models of QCD that maybe we can solve and tell you about the bound states. And what I tried to convey is all of these subjects get tied together and shed light on one another um, through a unifying picture that arises in string theory. Now, there are many other places where I could have given you a similar unifying picture, mother, many other areas of mathematics and physics, but I picked a particular slice in which I've had some fun myself. So thanks for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Shamit. I don't know if people can unmute themselves. Um, and give you a round of applause, thank you very much. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I think we have time for some questions. Um, so if people want to um, uh, put their hands up, um, there we go. So we have a question from uh, Bandan. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for the amazing talks. Uh, can you please uh, once again explain the concept of instantons? 
Um, I can very roughly explain the concept of instantons. So um, uh, I'm not sure what your background is, but- um, I'm an undergraduate student. Okay, so um, you know that, that um, there are topological invariants in, in mathematics, like in, in, in studying two-dimensional surfaces, you could count numbers of holes in the surface and that's a topological invariant. Um, so in, in, in these gauge theories, there are other topological invariants that come from studying the, the, the analog of the electromagnetic field itself. So if you're an undergraduate in, in physics, you probably encountered electric fields and magnetic fields, right? And um, it turns out that, that in theories with a field, you know, with field strengths like the electric and magnetic field, um, you can take integrals of suitable products of, of E and B and integrate them over space um, and, get, and get interesting integers on compact spaces. So those integers are, are, um, are called instanton numbers. They classify topological configurations of the field strengths themselves. And what, instantons are, what, what these instantons are, are um, roughly configurations of these fields that have non-trivial values of those integrals. So non-trivial integrals of, of, you know, of products of E and B, um, but generalized to, to gauge to, to theories more complicated than electromagnetism. And those non-trivial field configurations contribute quantum corrections that you can't see in perturbation theory by Feynman diagrams because there are quantized integers different from, from what the, the, the theory's vacuum would have had. So they can't be accessed perturbatively, they're quantized. I don't know if that answers your question or not. I see, yeah. thank you. Um, I have a question here, which uh, was sent through to me from uh, Tapaswini Sharma um, that says, um, what is the structure of space-time in string theory? Is it similar to that in loop quantum gravity? Okay, so now I'm, I have to admit to two different forms of ignorance in answer to your question. One is, I don't really know the structure of space-time and loop quantum gravity. That's because of my ignorance of the theory. It shouldn't be taken as a comment. I just don't know it. Um, about string theory, I think I have reasonable pictures. And there I would say, we can't really answer the question. Um, there are different ways in which we know space-time at, you know, in, in different limits can look different than what we traditionally expect. In just perturbative string theory, we know that there are perfectly reasonable backgrounds that aren't well described by strings propagating on a Riemannian manifold, but are described by something more abstract called a conformal field theory. Um, in other limits, we know that space-time can emerge what's called holographically um, through encoding in, in a different kind of conformal field theory. And there, um, as we make that, th th this dual description, the conformal field theory more weakly coupled, the space-time becomes curved in an uncontrolled way again, where there's no clear geometric description. So it's clear that string theory gives precise ways to capture geometry beyond Riemannian geometry, but I can't describe it vivid, you know, vividly as spaces weaved of loops of string or you know, some, some, uh, some model like that. Sure, thank you. Um, there's a question here from uh, Seth Catalano. Um, I don't know if you can unmute, your, unmute yourself there. Yeah, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay, um, I had a question going back to the very beginning of the talk, you had mentioned that there's going to be a new particle accelerator within the next few decades. And I was wondering what we might expect to see there. Okay, well, um, I'm a big fan of, um, you know, of curiosity-based science. Uh, I, I would say I have no idea what we'll, what we'll see there. Um, I, we're not sure that this will be built. There's a, a proposal at CERN the big European center to build uh, this, uh, this much larger analog of, of, the, uh, of the LHC. Um, the proposed date for turn on is 2048. Uh, you'll probably still be alive, I probably won't. But, um, but uh, if that's built, you know, the hopes would be that it will shed light on what it is that, that stabilizes electroweak symmetry breaking. That is, that explains why the Higgs particle has the mass that it does and, and is able to coexist with other things we know or suspect about physics. So examples of such theories would be other strongly interacting particles that could mean that the Higgs is composite, but other examples would be supersymmetric particles that could explain the lightness of the Higgs through cancellations of supersymmetry. Um, but we don't know what it would find. It's, it's, you know, it's possible it would find a desert. Um, and the only way you can answer questions like this is, um, is by actually doing the experiment. That's why experiments are great. I see, thank you. Fantastic. Do we have any other questions? Um, nothing coming through there at the moment. Okay. Um, 
so I, I think, yeah, I'd just like to, to thank you very much, uh, Shamit, for, for giving us this, this presentation. I think it's very important um, to be able to talk to a wider audience. Um, and so I think you're a sort of ideally suited person to do this. So thank you very much for, for taking part in this. Um, and I hope everybody else has enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Um, Thanks, John. So will there be private discussion rooms today? There is a good question. Jeff, um, are yeah, they going to be? No, no, they won't. <clears throat> so we've got, a, we've got a long couple of days tomorrow and, and, uh, and Friday. So we thought we'd give everybody a, a bit of a break today. But thank you. So, so there much. will be tomorrow? There will be tomorrow. There'll be a couple tomorrow. Um, we will also be having a uh, panel discussion in the evening. Well, my evening anyway. Um, <clears throat> and then on, on diversity and inclusivity and in high energy theory. Uh, and then on Friday, we'll be having the black hole session. And then there'll be a panel discussion there as well. OK, cool. Thank you. Sure. So thanks for joining everybody. Um, it was great to see everybody here for the for the public talk. Uh, and I wish you all good afternoon, good evening, good night. And for those of you who are part of the Strings Conference, we'll see you um, uh, tomorrow morning, midday, afternoon. Thank you.